Check, check, semblance, semblance, check, check. So okay. what are we ta- what are we doing exactly now? Are, are we literally coming in and doing a special edition? So are, okay. okay, now we're, we're, what are we talking? Are we talking about close encounters specifically? Or are we talking about other things around it? What are we talking about? Well, I think we should probably go into a little bit more about Spielberg. Okay. Close encounters of the first kind. Sighting of an unidentified flying object. Close encounters of the second kind. Physical evidence of a UFO. Close encounters of the third kind. Actual contact. Columbia Pictures, in association with EMI, presents Close Encounters of the Third Kind. And what happened this week? I mean, you contacted me. Suddenly, it's not like Bill Cosby. You! You! Contacted me! Contact! Me <laughs> and about you said, the Jello pudding. <laughs> you said, "Are you going to see Close Encounters?" I'm like, "What?" Yeah, and you're like, was, well, "It's in theaters, dude." Yeah. You didn't, you didn't notice. Yeah, like, yeah. Oh, man, that's totally grody. So I grabbed the family, and we went and spent an enormous sum of money. Yeah, uh, you, <laughs> you told me of how much you spent. And did you get popcorn? Did you do the whole? thing? I did, of course. I always do that. I always get the did popcorn. You get the, the, I got, I got a. Uh, well, Bronwyn had a burger. And uh, me and Regan had had Franks, Nathan's sirloin Franks. You didn't get the Cheech and Chong from it's it's uh, it came from Hollywood sized popcorn. When uh, it comes well, I had a big one, and it took me two days to finish because I took it home. <laughs> but the thing about it is, what I love about movie theaters now is yeah. that you can go in and you can put as much buttercolor topping on your popcorn as possible because they have their own individual machine that you can operate. Mm-hmm. So when you say extra butter, you know, with me, I love that stuff i know it's not real butter and people are always annoying me about that but uh, but i love putting it on so I, I just drown it i drown it in butter yeah you know something else will, it's, something else will kill you before that will i'm pretty sure yes <laughs> well uh, but so we went to the theater okay we saw it in this new system or whatever it is called rpx which is called regal premium experience yeah. i saw it at a regal theater and you saw I, it as standard. I saw it at an AMC uh, Dolby Cinema Theater, which it I don't think it has. I think RPX isn't it like don't they put like special subwoofers in the seats or something and they shake or something? Am I correct I, in that? No, I don't think they did. Okay, that at all. I, that's probably another theater. But the only yeah. thing we had the the Regal Premium Experience is just the the seats are slightly more comfortable. Although that really doesn't matter now because the seats are always very comfortable to move yeah. these days. And reserve seating, so we get to pick our yeah. seats. I got that too in the Dolby Cinema. They're almost like they're almost like Al Bundy uh, rest. No, they're almost like the, the that chair that the the dad and Fraser had. <laughs> it's kind of, yeah, they kind Except of rock. Except it's nicer. Yeah, it's ours like this, rocked. We were able to like you know, hey, this is nice. They rock. It's made but, of rich Corinthian leather. You, know, you have this nice this nice big seat you can sit in. It's got and it take, always takes me forever to figure out how the seat because it has like a, a thing you can go back in. And mm-hmm. it, I needed to kind of go back because I had reserved seating as well, and I had to uh, figure out what the seat I wanted was in in relation to the theater. And they flip a thing around. They say, pick your seat. And I look, and I'm like, okay, is this – I want generally in the middle, but it looks weird. So I'm like, okay, I'll pick this one. So I picked this one, and it's like row D, which is, I think, four rows up. Mm-hmm. And it's still kind of close. So – uh, I yeah, was, we picked. I kind of, uh, I kind of had to go back a little. Was it a stadium to, seating situation? Yeah, sta- it's like it's like this weird stadium row seating where everything is is very nice and and very spread out. I mean, I remember looking at the thing and like the capacity of the whole theater. And it's a big ass theater. It's it like was. It was a very big theater. Very but yet, big the street, ca- huh? yet the capacity is like 188 seats. Mm-hmm. So they they just they spread out the seats. Well, this is like I mean like. It's, it's a very nice viewing experience, especially when you get to pick your own seat. My optimum viewing area is probably row E, mm-hmm. and for the three of us, seats 9, 10, and 11. So we're right in the center, and the, pick, the, the, the movie screen is equidistant from us. We're mm-hmm. very much in the middle of the action, which is what I really like. And we're not too close, so it's, it, you know, theoretically, it's a, a much better experience. But we had to pay like $21 
and change for two adults and $17 and change for a child. And I'm just thinking it's really not worth it. I, I felt like I wanted more. I know people complain about reserved seating because I've heard people complain about it saying that a lot of the theaters, the places where you sit or, or you know, your reserved seat is loaded with like garbage and everything. But this theater was pristine, I have to say. Oh, yeah. The one I went to was too as well. I mean, and, it, yeah. it, was, it was. Everything is really nice. When when I go to the movies now, it is even when it's just a regular theater, it's much better than going to the movies. Like if we had seen if we had seen this in 1977, I mean, people maybe I'm gonna remember, but in the late 70s, even early 80s, everything was kind of run down and like it really, yeah, yeah, everything was falling apart everywhere. And like I would go to the movies. I mean, it was a cheap experience, but you kind of got what you paid for. So even though, you know, if, if it costs like four bucks to go to a movie, which would be maybe like eight bucks or something now. Yeah. You know, you got about eight bucks worth of entertainment because you didn't get even get eight bucks worth of entertainment. You got like about two dollars worth of entertainment. It's it's like you might as well rent well, we a movie. Had, we had so many more options. Like I remember when I was a kid, there were many, many theaters everywhere in the area. Now we know where I live. There's only the the uh, Regal uh, Kaufman 14. Which... Yeah, but it's got 14 screens. I mean, it's. It's enormous. It takes up an entire city block. Yeah, I mean, at that time, there certainly wouldn't be re-releasing movies from forty years before. They wouldn't. There wouldn't be a theater playing, say, Gone with the Wind. At this that is time. really great. I I love this idea. Mm -hmm. I'm not fond of the execution, which we'll get into later. Yeah. But I love the idea that they're bringing back all these classic movies for their anniversaries for very limited runs. It's very nice. We're going to see. We're seeing Star Trek II: The Wrath of Khan next week, and yeah. uh, E.T. is also playing. It will be re-released as well. Uh, the next week after that not playing at our theater unfortunately i really would have liked to see that yeah in my... uh those are like special there are different kind of releases like this close encounters release was a you know it was on 900 screens it was it was a sort of a sony release it mm -hmm. was like a, it was almost like a real movie coming out whereas those i think those things are more like sort of a fathom events yeah like very special kind of thing almost like when they do well, concerts they moved, and everything. They moved close encounters very quickly out of the RP rpx theater and they moved it into it um, well, it's going to get a lot of a lot of people are going to be going to that. But I the think. RPX Theater is really it's it's kind of separate from the rest of it because it's like it's got this very impressive lighted sign that says RPX. You know, this is yeah. the RPX Theater. And I was like, what is RPX? I'm not really sure what that means. It's the Regal Premium Experience. Until we well, until we figured it out, I was I was I was for a second I was a little bit scared because I thought it was going to be only for like people in wheelchairs who spoke Spanish or something. <laughs> no, so the director like is Steven Spielberg, whose most recent motion picture, Jaws, is already a legend. The producers are Julia Phillips and Michael Phillips of The Sting and Taxi Driver. Creating special effects is Douglas Trumbull, who in this film goes far beyond his achievements in 2001 A Space Odyssey. For the music, there was only one choice. 11-time Academy Award nominee, John Williams, composer of the scores for Jaws and Star Wars. The technical advisor is the world's foremost authority on unidentified flying objects, Dr. J. Allen Hynek of Northwestern University. Heading the cast is Richard Dreyfuss, who has shown his rare talent in such diverse films as American Graffiti, The Apprenticeship of Duty Kravitz, and Jaws. And making his American debut as an actor is the great French director, Francois Truffaut, winner of the 1974 Academy Award. Hey, I don't know if you remember this. Close Encounters was a, uh, a Good Times home video title. Really? Because Columbia Pictures sold the rights to their, a few of their movies, and they were Good Times. Now, you may even be able to find a picture what? of this. It was a Good Times title, I remember, because I remember going, what? This, this, is a made, this is like their biggest hit that they'd had until like... Maybe like I think until Tootsie actually, and then um, made, and if you yeah, adjust yeah. for inflation, it was probably about the same. And then Ghostbusters probably made more, but still, it was like one of their top hits ever at Columbia Pictures. They and must put have that, had some kind of an issue, and it might have had to do with the producers of the. Uh, no, I because I remember it was a few Columbia um, titles. With that well, it was Crawl. It was uh, there were a few. I think like uh, like a few of their kind of bigish titles were Good Times. I remember. The like Collector only has Columbia RCA. Um, the original Columbia Pictures Home Entertainment mm -hmm. uh, video and uh, sure, I'll I'll use my own sources. Columbia TriStar. Let's see. It, yeah, it looks very similar. 
Yeah, <laughs> you know, you know, you know, it's cheap. It says Steven Spielberg's UFO classic splayed across it, and I'm like, that, that, that's just, is that okay. it? That's it. It's got to be it. It's like I a, a to, little, need, a yellow banner in the corner. Yeah, it's got a yellow banner in the corner. I got, I can't really see the side. It's the side that'll show, say, Good Times, and then I can't really. The picture's too small. That is you know, just. Get it out was of a here. good. <laughs> I know, I know. I swear it was a yeah. It's a good times. Send it to Mr. David Lawler. That's P.O. Box one five one nine nine, Spokane, hey, Washington. The... <laughs> That's That'd where the home to... office is That'd for tax reasons. Me. Pay to the order of Iron Balls McGinty. There we go. Don't forget the P.O. Box. I can't think Spielberg was happy about this. <laughs> there must have been some kind of a weird shakeup at Columbia. Maybe it had something to do with David Beagleman because David Beagleman was running Columbia around that time, and he went he he was like he went to jail for embezzlement. He got out of jail and then wound up running United Artists, which is probably not a good idea. Okay, either. if I remember correctly, it w it might have been right around the Coca Cola years, like it might have been around those sort of mid eighties before Sony bought them. I think it was in those Coca Cola years when they were like. Like the embassy entertainment was kind of part of Sony or not, not Sony, uh, Coca-Cola, like Coca-Cola owned both Columbia and embassy at the time. Maybe that mm -hmm. was part of, maybe that was part of why they sold the rights to some of their movies to good time. So that like for like antitrust reasons or something, maybe huh. that was what it was Yeah, to kind of like bury them. You had I, that, I mean, good times is terrible. We'll probably be talking about good times at some point. Well, we will actually with mm -hmm. the, uh, with the small fry, which are coming up, I guess. Yeah. It's such um, d d such terrible quality. You had to, it had really bad sound and mm -hmm. a lot of their stuff being recorded on LP and you had to turn it all the way up and you'd had this horrible it, hiss. They'd be recorded at LP, maybe not even in hi-fi stereo, which, you know, by the mid eighties, all tapes were recorded in hi-fi stereo right. or at least hi-fi mono, depending on the film. So you'd get good quality, even if it was at a low speed. So, but yeah, if, it, if it'd be like the cheapest way they could possibly crank it out. But to, and, and then not only that, it cheapens the movie, the UFO classic. I mean, come on. The UFO classic, yeah. It was released in theaters in 77. Then the special edition came out in the theaters in 1980. Then the special edition came out on various video formats from RCA Columbia Home Video. Then in the mid 80s, uh, they just sold the rights, and they but it was just the special edition. The original version was not on any sort of video medium until it was on Criterion, and that's kind of like a special licensed kind of deal. down at the very end i saw the aliens i mean there are different versions of the same alien that look completely different like they come out of the ship and they're actually just like look, look like little kids with masks on yeah they're running like, around with, bumping into with each fog other and, and everything which is fine if you want to have them look like that but then another alien comes out and it it looks completely different it's like this weird sort of big ass alien scary looking thing that comes out out of nowhere which is it comes out and then it's it's gone it like it kind of the one that comes out like when the first the thing like opens up and then this this big stringy looking alien comes out and you only kind of see him partially and he comes out and then he's gone and then the little ones come out now he didn't go back in i don't know where he went and then at the very end 
another alien comes out that looks that when it first comes out looks like one of those little kid aliens. Yeah. But then but then it does like the hand signal thing and it looks like a kind of a cheesy special effect. It looks like an animatronic. I've always thing. loved that scene. I had to look but at it again when scene. we got home. I, uh, I wanted to I, give you uh, Regan's like impressions of the movie. She was so uh, drawn into it mm -hmm. that she could say nothing other than that she loved it. I mean, she was like really um, affected by the movie and and like beyond words. I mean, it's yeah, like it, she was so completely drawn into the movie there were some little frightening bits and sometimes she put sometimes i think the sound was a little too loud because she kept putting her fingers in her ears because it was getting really loud mm -hmm. but, yeah, but otherwise I, you know and she, the, she hates trailers too i want to mention this every time they show trailers which i don't understand i paid 21 dollars for this movie and they're still showing advertisements and a shitload of trailers oh yeah but, they show trailers <laughs> they show trailers for regular movies which sounded excellent i don't know they probably sounded excellent in your theater and then once they the looked movie, really good once the movie actually started, although before the movie started, they had a little conversation with Spielberg and he talked right, about, was the movie, about a which, which spoils it for people thing. who haven't seen yes, it. Yes, yes, really. that totally. You know, I mean, I, I wanted Regan to experience this. And, and the thing is, if you're going to show this movie, if you're going to re-release it, re-release it as a movie. Don't, you know, how about a little little uh, text at the beginning of the movie before the movie starts? Stay, stay for the behind the scenes. Stay for a conversation that'll probably be on the Blu-ray anyway. Yeah, it's yeah. Probably, but, it looked like a Blu-ray extra. But it kind feature. of ruins it a little bit for reading because it, it shows technical... all of the key moments. You know? There was a technical weirdness where anytime someone was talking, mostly Spielberg in that in that little thing, the sound was like on way on the right of the picture. And I thought, oh no, yeah. is the whole movie going to be coming out of the right side of the screen? And it wasn't. It was just some sort of weird technical glitch where that clip, it was, and I, I don't know why that was. Maybe it was just my presentation. I don't know. Right. Um, but uh, so the, the movie, but then the movie starts. Now again, I saw this in the Dolby Cinema. And what Dolby Cinema is, it's basically a projected 4K laser. I don't exactly know how it where it uses lasers. Lasers. And lasers. Pew, 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 pew. Yeah. <laughs> and I, it has what's called high dynamic range, which is the new buzzword. Uh, it's basically like deep, deep black, like black blacks and super white, bright whites. Mm -hmm. Kind of like when you have a TV and you turn the contrast all the way up. So everything is just blindingly bright. Yeah. And in your vivid mode, like sports mode. And that's kind of what it was. Now, if it's if it's filmed that way and it's made that way and it's it's like projected properly, it can be great. But when you're taking an old movie that isn't really wasn't really shot that way, it was shot on film, shot on 35 millimeter film. Yeah. And then if you were lucky, you saw like a 70 millimeter blow up or something in, in 77. Oh, um, man. Can you imagine what that would look like? It would probably look a lot like this, I would think. Although I know. Probably, I, it'd probably I, a little softer. But yeah. Uh, but I think that the disadvantage of the, of this kind of movie is a lot of special effects, a lot of optical prints, which is they run a piece of film through a piece of film over a piece of film and piece. Mm -hmm. of, so there's lots of degradation in picture. And then when you take that and you blow it up to a big screen and you digitally, they didn't clean it up. I, I didn't see notice that they like cleaned it up or they were trying to get the best version, the best version of that film that they could get like as originally shown, it's not like star Wars where they went in and cleaned it up and changed the sound and everything. No, the sound was, was very, Hmm. How would I put this good, but not great and underwhelming. And it was not a Dolby cinema experience as far as sound, because it sounded like the original sort of Dolby stereo mix just, and it wasn't even like remixed, like to go through all the speakers. It's or interesting anything. too, because I would think with, uh, with whatever hard drive they're using, mm -hmm. uh, they would be able to incorporate every single kind of mix. Well, yeah, but it's for every uh, for every speaker that they're using. Yeah, that's I felt what I... I felt that mainly in my theater, the sound mm -hmm. was coming from the screen. It maybe, was maybe a maybe maybe the music. I don't know. I wasn't concentrating on it enough. I was. I, I was like maybe trying the to music get... was coming from the right. I was right trying and left to get speakers. every sort of technical sort of aspect of this movie sort of in because I already had seen this movie so many times. I thought that it had a very sort of front sound stage, but it was lots of good separation. Like there was, you could get a very good stereo effect. There was it was a good actually, amount. Yeah, it was pretty good for that. I could I could really. There was a good amount of bass, but not like the newer movies where they really. There was a lot of good bass. Yeah. You can take a piece of film and expose it under extremely low light and still have it look wonderful. 
Whereas with digital, I always have this problem. I had to take, <laughs> I had to take pictures of, um, of Regan uh, yesterday for when for her first day at fifth grade, right? Mm -hmm. And I was in a very dark kitchen, and it really could not get a decent image. It the only time digital really works for me, in in a mode that's even maybe even superior to film or at least equal to it is 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 daylight. You, you take digital cameras out, the, and it's still a problem they have. I mean, they've had this problem for over 20 years with their digi with digital technology is that you can only get really decent stuff with uh, natural sunlight. You can't really get good stuff with, with artificial lighting. Artificial lighting, it's, it, it tends to look really bad. And, and this is a problem that I've had with film of recent. Most films being made today are not being shot with, with, with the kind of care and beauty that film can provide. You know, mm -hmm. And I've, re I've really noticed this. I was looking at some... Mario Bava films, uh, Italian horror cinema last night, and I was like, Jesus, nobody shoots like this anymore. I mean, it's just so nuanced and delicate and great well, also, color I mean, balance. They, Everything they probably, is oversaturated now. Have you they noticed probably, this? They probably used the three-strip trip te Technicolor at that time because they stopped using that like in the late 70s Oh, man, or something. it was so wonderful. Why can't we go back to that? Anyway. I don't know. It's too expensive. Everything's too expensive. I they want to get it out cheap. Yeah, I guess, I guess they do, but, but for what we paid for our premium experience... Yeah, you should be. Film, Spielberg should be running those cans himself. Yeah. You know? <laughs> and then, of course, I only pay like 10 50 because uh, I'm and, up and there. And I want to mention here a comment that Spielberg made. Yeah. Spielberg stated that uh, though digital projection produces a much better image than film if originally shot in digital, it is inferior when it has been converted to digital. And he tried to get Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull projected solely on film. They wouldn't let him. And he's Spielberg, for Christ's sake. <laughs> he's a guy who could snap his fingers and have us all murdered tomorrow. So he actually shot to... that on film, then? You're saying. Uh, yeah, he tried, yeah. But it was like film, but he had an eye toward digital. So if you have an he eye toward have digital... Been, he would have been one of the last, because it would have been one of the last, because that was 2008. So I bet when he shoots the next one, it probably will be digital. 1047. Spielberg has later gone on to sort of somewhat disown the special edition and say, no, it was better. It was better that I did it the original. And then he kind of what he did was he 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 wanted the original ending, but he also wanted to sort of tweak the middle a few scenes here and there that kind of make it a little more cohesive. I don't, but you know, on, I think the, a lot the, of those scenes are a little bit much, especially with I don't know whatever this new version is that we watched. This 40th anniversary version yeah. is another version altogether. No, it's it's the because it incorporates the final, elements the of the original cut. cut. It's the third and... cut from the late '90s that he finally said, "Okay, now I'm done." It's the one that came out sort of Until, it was like you know, it, ten years you know, from now when he changed uh, it. Maybe, <laughs> uh, but it's like it I've was. I've got extra shots of Dreyfus shaving <laughs> or something, and I want to put them in there. More sunburn. Um, <laughs> but sunburn. It, hey, at least at least he didn't do this like isn't a, a moon burn guy and go in it. and like change the special <laughs> effects. And this is a kind of movie where. Maybe they should have come in and fixed the special effects, at least at the end, with the cheesy aliens. Because <laughs> the only the only reason you buy it as much as you do is because of that music. The music I, distracts you, know, you from really the like crappiness those aliens. of the I know I know they're facts. not the best technology, but they're I mean there's there's a nice it's it's kind of like a, a charming cheese to it. You know, it's kind of like, you know, we're we're about to do E. T. and we're not quite sure how to get there yet. And well, they did better with I think e. Spielberg they needed to e. see it all before yeah. he could say uh, okay, I don't like this, uh, or we're in such a rush. And they were in a rush. The, the, by the time they finally finished the movie, they were almost ready to release it. Yeah, but what's funny is is on the back of the Laserdisc, when I was reading it, it's like this, because it's got so much room to fill on that disc. It's got it's almost like liner notes on, a, on an album, and they're explaining there's this huge section where it's basically Spielberg sort of, to quote Spielberg, of like how he was so happy that he was able to go back and do with the special edition and why it's important, why yeah. it's better. And so it's like, you know, he kind of contradicts himself of no, I, I didn't like the special edition. He, he basically says he was rushed when he was making the original version, which, you know, it's understandable. He has a release date, right. but then, but then like, okay, he does this, he has time. He does the special edition, but then he comes back, you know, 10 years later and says, no, no, I didn't like that, and that was kind of rushed or something. He, he like yeah. has another excuse of why he didn't like that. I'm like, I mean, you're you're Steven Spielberg, you know, and you'll always have my respect, and you always make good movies, even if I don't always, I'm not 100 percent entertained by them. They're always good. Even a crappy movie is pretty good. Always isn't bad, you know. 
Mm. That's probably one of his worst, considering. Mm. Another Richard Dreyfus movie. And, you know, I got to say, I'm not like, let's, we might as well talk a little bit about the man. Um, not really big on, I know a lot of people love it, but I'm not a big fan of The Color Purple. I just, uh, and also Amistad. I really don't like uh, Spielberg going there in, in, in that way. You don't like him using his Spielbergian nature for important things like that? Is that well, what you're saying? Well, I mean, I, you know what? I really enjoyed The Empire of the Sun. I really like that one a lot. I, I love the uh, way it looks movie. visually. And it's, it, it is one of his mature movies in a, in a sense. It's not like, I mean, he, kind of, he had these periods where he was the 70s filmmaker somewhat radical uh and 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 sort of he took like a b movie and made it on a big budget you know like mm-hmm. jaws and yeah. then close encounters continues along those lines 1941 was excess and he has this kind of nine lives thing going on like you know a what cat. I, I give him a pass on 1941 because he says in, in the sort of the the making of it's almost like he got swept up in the fun and kind of forgot to make a movie <laughs> because he's he's hanging out with his buddies and they're all having just this great time. There's a lot of incredible visual set pieces in the they're movie. They're all having fun, you know, perhaps cocaine was involved, <laughs> you know. So a lot there a lot of people were having fun then and it's it's sometimes you don't make the best product when you're just kind of like goofing around and having fun and spending a lot of money. <laughs> well, there was this connection to uh one of my favorite filmmakers also, John Landis. Uh they were buddies for a short time. And they made a bet with each other about who could make the most expensive movie. And Landis made uh, Blues Brothers. Blues Brothers, yeah. Uh, but Spielberg made 40, 1941 first. Uh, and Spielberg put Landis in the movie in a cameo. And Landis beat him the next year with, with the Blues Brothers in the budget and put him in a cameo at the end of the movie. Oh, yeah, a classic cameo, by the yes. way. Like, yeah, the budget for 1941 was $35 million. There you go. Of which uh, it made ninety four point nine million in the box office. Not not an enormous hit. Not a not a not a huge hit, but not a flop either. And the Blues Brothers, which you know destroyed thousands of vehicles, was a thirty million dollar budget, but it made one hundred and fifteen, so it was much more successful. And I think it's a much better movie too. Blue, Blues Brothers is. Probably one of the top ten best movies of all time, as far as I'm concerned. I I love the movie. I love it. I I have it on. Um, you know, I got like this four pack on DVD, but it's a four pack of movies. It's the Blues Brothers, Blues Brothers 2000, Fletch, <laughs> and Fletch Lives, and yeah. it's four movies on DVD for I think it cost me five dollars. He certainly got more than five dollars worth of entertainment out of that. Oh God, yes. But during that 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 time period, uh, Spielberg and Landis were friends. Their friendship ended unceremoniously. You know, no surprise on on Twilight Zone the movie. So, but now, why would they have a personal beef against each other for an accident that happened? That, by the way, he was completely cleared up for. It was just one of those. Is it because Spielberg was maybe like was Spielberg a producer on that movie, and he kind of got shafted as far as like the settlement both, of both Spielberg, Spielberg and Landis produced it. That's the commonality they had. They were okay. both fans of the original show and they wanted to make a movie. And hopefully if it would have worked out, they would have made like an anthology uh, series of, of, of movies and uh, reignited the Twilight Zone franchise. As, one could argue product. that Spielberg's segment is, although the huge tragedy of the Landis segment, Landis segment is, is, is probably better than the Spielberg because the Spielberg segment is so Spielberg. It's like E.T. had a baby. Of course, uh, George Miller outdoes both of them with his segment. George Miller and Joe Dante. Oh, Joe and Joe Dante, They turn in the two best episodes, and they, it's strange because they are the least known of the filmmakers. That's true. In fact, uh, he went, I think, uh, because Joe Dante would go from that into Gremlins, I think, which is almost like an extension of that segment, if you think about it. It's kind of like just a longer version of that. It's just like, but it's it's a different sort of plot, but it's like scary monster creature effects, somewhat disturbing. Right, and he sort of became Spielberg's protege Mm -hmm. for a time. uh, Without all that weird Toby Hooper without all that weird Toby Hooper stuff going on behind the scenes. Yeah, he would do Gremlins and he would do he would do another I think Explorers? two movies. He would do Explorers, but I don't think that was a Spielberg production. I th- maybe I it think was. It might have been, yeah. Um, then he would do uh, Inner Space. 
Inner Space was also that was that was an Amblin. That was you know Spielberg. Uh, you know established a lot of relationships. I think Spielberg's greatest gift in Hollywood is to survive, and I think that what it is is he had he had mentors, and you remember we were talking about Michael Cimino. And Chimino's attitude toward the people that were giving him money. I think Spielberg does the exact opposite. I think he's a very nice guy. Um, and he'll do favors for people. And he had a mentor in Lou Wasserman, who ran Universal. So he was able to he was able to survive. He always he always had a home in Universal. Well, also, too. if I remember correctly, he pretty much produced his own movies starting I would say like after I think uh like Raiders, like E.T., he didn't... He, yeah, E.T. was an Amblin production. Yeah. So I think that was kind of the start of... And uh, and, and he also, made money. Uh, I mean, he made money for every studio. Yeah, he, he made a lot of money for Universal. Like, he always just wanted to direct, but he realized if he produces the movie and he's more in charge of like the money aspect, which he I, apparently he didn't like, and he just mm -hmm. wanted to make a movie, he could at least control what he was trying to make. He would always have final cut because if he's the only time he's he's a hired hand now is when he makes uh, those Indiana Jones movies. He's just a hired hand. Yeah, and he made and, a lot of money for Paramount too. Yeah, Paramount, and he, Columbia, Universal, Warner Brothers. Uh, did he? Yeah, well, I guess if he produced for uh, movies for like MGM, like say Poltergeist, which also made a lot of money. So he. Spread I think that was out right these, before. He, I think that was might have been right before it was actually like Amblin Entertainment. Yeah, might have been. Amblin yeah. was the first production of Amblin, I believe. Uh, it wasn't E.T. It was something else. What was the first Amblin? Doesn't production? it say Amblin Entertainment on it now, though? Uh, Continental Divide. That's what it was. Ah, the first, another Belushi movie. Yeah. The first Amblin production was Continental Divide. Um, it had been like 81, I think. That was 81. It didn't have the, the popular logo, of course. The popular logo is no. from E.T. And then E.T. after that, Gremlins. Uh, Fandango, which Kevin Reynolds directed, starring Kevin Costner, mm -hmm. uh, launched Kevin Reynolds' career. The Goonies after that, Back to the Future, Young Sherlock Holmes, The Color Purple, The Money Pit. I remember that. I remember really liking that movie a lot, actually. Batteries Not Included, oh, which I, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about because the Close Encounters, okay, the screenplay. Now, I've, I've, I've read about the screenplay not actually having been written by Spielberg. From what I understand, he had asked Paul Schrader to write a screenplay. Uh, Paul Schrader turned in a screenplay, but it wasn't anything he wanted to shoot. So he asked a bunch of other people to submit ideas, and they all basically gave him a bunch of ideas, which he worked into a screenplay. Matthew Robbins claims that he wrote, actually, most of the script. He says he wrote 75% of that script. Spielberg rewarded him. Uh, by not giving him credit, but giving him box office percentage points, so he made a lot of money off of it. He took he took that money and made Corvette Summer with Mark Hamill, and Batteries Not Included. <laughs> oh, okay, that would have been later. Yeah, yeah, but Batteries Not Included. I mean, like Spielberg kind of you know shepherded him in a way, but Robbins was a little bit uh, pissed off. Do you think he did kind of like a Toby Hooper thing? Like, but he didn't do like Toby Hooper and, and somewhat pitch a fit. He's like, yes, <laughs> whatever you say, sir. He did. Well, you know, I mean, like, I guess for Spielberg, money is 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 the is the award rather than the credit or something like that. But Matthew Robbins does get like a special thanks at the end of the credits. And he also has a a little bit part in the movie. That's almost like a like the the, the script for Superman, the movie, how it said like executive like creative consultant Tom Makowitz, you know, he he basically wrote the movie, but he he but he can't couldn't get a written there, by credit. You know, there are a lot of reasons why people won't accept credit. Like for example, I believe uh, Howard Sackler uh, wrote a good portion of the Jaws script. He rewrote like Peter Benchley's draft, and then Carl Gottlieb rewrote that. Um, but Howard Sackler refused credit for some reason. And so it was only credited to Carl Gottlieb and Peter Benchley. Look, I understand like there are interesting sort of like rules of like you have to have written a certain percent or had come on at a certain time or it's it's some sort of there are politics, but it's it's mostly to protect certain people that it's it's, it's meant to protect the writers sort of, but it ends up sometimes screwing them over. 
and they just don't get credit and they maybe they even get paid i don't know and sometimes know. it can depend on if you're a member of the guild you know yeah. if you're if you're in the writers guild you have you get certain uh preference over other writers you know mm -hmm. and a lot of times these unions are, are very strange i mean like two interesting stories i if i'm i think spielberg is a member of the of the director's guild um, but for some reason, uh, both George Lucas and John Landis are, are, were not members. George Lucas had to pay through the nose to become a member of the Director's Guild. They wouldn't let Landis be a member of the Director's Guild because he didn't have a college degree. The Director's Guild uh, sued or something. They fined George Lucas for not having credits at the beginning of the Star Wars movies. Exactly, and he had to leave... He had to leave, or get, he got fined. I think he left. He's he not part fined. of the Director's Guild. He got fined. Well, he didn't get fined for the first movie. He got fined for the second one yeah. because Irving Kirshner was a member of the guild. Irving Kirshner was the one who was fined. So George Lucas paid his fine and revoked his membership with the DGA. Almost like as a protest? Yeah. Yeah. Mm. And, it, and it does show that you don't have to be a member of a stupid union or a guild. All they're doing is like accepting dues most of the time, you know, lots of money. So Spielberg has a gift to be able to cultivate relationships uh with people and no one ever had an unkind thing to say say about him except his personal friends that's about it <laughs> you know i mean well, you know he, when you work with somebody for, for when you work with some people. when you work with somebody that you like even that you like when you work with them long enough you're gonna always have a few complaints it's just it's like with family you just you, you love them but sometimes they do things that maybe you don't like and then when, yeah. and then and then when it and then when it comes to money then that's when it really i mean even with family it's like when they start to like mess with your money or somehow affects your money you yeah. get this sort of deep resentment that like comes from the depths of hell mm -hmm. then it doesn't make you a good person <laughs> yeah. and so i can see why it's like maybe he was not intentionally doing whatever it is he's been accused of it's just when it comes to money, everybody everybody wants to get theirs. Yeah, and people want their credit or whatever. Well, yeah, he he can smooth it over. I mean, he's not. I wouldn't call him um, a thief in any sense of the word. Mm. Uh, he just takes what he wants for his movies, and then but he pays. He pays. You know, he a tries lot of people to. Every don't. Every once in a while, stuff gets mismanaged or something, and somebody doesn't get what they were supposed to get, or somebody like said, "Oh yeah, you'll get your money," and they don't get their money. And he doesn't lift ideas outright and claim them as his own, like like. Like um, like our friend James Cameron. James Cameron, he is one of the biggest thieves, but he usually steals from very obscure sources sometimes. Like uh, Terminator, when Terminator came out, it was basically kind of a ripoff of a Harlan Ellison story. Harlan Ellison sued. He got a lot of money out of it, and he got a credit at the end of the Terminator. Yeah, in fact, you get in the in the sort of the early video editions of it, you, he gets a very wobbly credit. It's a like, very wobbly, tacked on. Tacked on the like producers video credit to on top the work of, of the film. Ellison. Yeah, video credit like it's on not top even of the like because it's a scroll, right? Yeah, and it's like they just shoved that in there and tried to make it look like it was part of the credits, but they and what it was, I know they failed like miserably. Land of the Lost looking kind of <laughs> and um, Avatar. Avatar is a complete ripoff of a Paul Anderson short story from the 1950s called Call Me Joe. I remember reading it and I was thinking because I read the story after I saw Avatar. Right. And I, I was reading it and I was like, it's about a, like a handicapped man who uh, who has like a, a like a like a kind of a, a, a av you know, avatar presence fighting a war on this planet for some kind of a mineral that they have. And I'm like, Jesus, this is Avatar. Oh, wow. Jeez, that's a because I was going to say it rips off, say, Man Called Horse, uh, Dances with Wolves, where the guy goes native and then a little bit off. of a little bit of everything. Yeah. But but I think that story came out first. But a, a great story, actually. That would be a really good story to shoot. Um, and also, who else? The uh, the Wachowski brothers slash sisters, whatever they are. Now Larry they're both sisters. Lyle. Now they're both sisters. Now. Yeah, they both. Whatever the whatever somebody slipped in their drink, it got to both of them. Yeah. Really? Yep. Jesus, I thought it was just Lana for it, a little. I while. thought it was just one, but I think the other one turned two now. So they've been they've been infected by whatever. <laughs> Uh, they, t I mean, like, um, the Matrix was ripped off from several different sources, but there was also uh, a, um, a, a woman who wrote a screenplay, sent it to them. It was very much, and she had it registered with the DGA, and uh, they settled out of court with her for like four million dollars. That they basically ripped off her idea. You know, so you can either be nice and give these people points for helping you out. 
or you can deny any contribution they may have made and deny mm -hmm. that you took anything and wind up paying through the nose later. You will get caught. But I guess I guess the lesson to people writing or creating oh, for Jesus always, Christ, it's Lily now. It's Lily. Lily always, and Lana. Always get your stuff registered repeatedly. That'd be my suggestion of like if you wrote something, register it, date it. I put do. It in the I book. do. Every script I write, I always register it with the DGA. It's like are, it's are $10. you a member of the DGA? I'm not a member. No, I just okay. get it registered. Just so, because it's very hard. I mean, like, you know, look at movies being made today, and you can see that it's very hard to have original ideas. It's very hard for, I mean, like, you're looking at every movie being made these days. It's always a variation of something you've seen before, because and apparently then, it's just incredibly hard to come up with. Original. So if I'm working my tail off to try and create an original story, I'm going to make sure it's protected. So, but but with, with Spielberg, what, what he has is this, this ability to tell a story that we're probably all familiar with, uh, but he has a certain style about him that that there are, the, and he has he has these periods in his work, like yeah, like, I want, like Picasso like he, or something. He he had this period where he was making like really sharp, witty, hip kind of movies. I I'd say maybe it started with the uh, Minority Report. Wait, uh, no, you're you're probably talking about his like mature period, right? No, I'm saying well, the mature it, I would say period, mature period, mature period. No, because because then he makes Catch Me If You Can. Where's the I'm talking on? like, okay. and then he makes, and then uh, two years later he makes uh, the the Terminal, with which I think is a lost classic, and not enough people have seen it. The one where Tom Hanks is in the, he's like he's from Krakowja, and he's in the he's in that terminal, and they built like this whole sort of airport terminal, and he basically lives there, and cr creates a life, and it's all like this story of like how he just wants to like. Uh, you know, spoiler alert, he wants to basically just drop off his ashes, his his father's ashes to right. some sort of jazz club or something like that. Yeah. And it's it's this sort of wonderful, whimsical, magical. It's it's this only Spielberg could do this because it's like it's, well, it's I sentimental. Thought it was cute. But... I thought it was cute. I, mm -hmm. it, to me, it wasn't by any means like a great cinematic masterpiece. It was just rather kind of cute. Well, then he does his heavy, he does his, like we were talking about his grown up period when he did like uh, saving private Ryan. Well, that's a completely different kind I of say, movie. And I yet I, it that's begins a really good with movie. Schindler's list. Yes. It begins but, with Schindler's list because he look did at Schindler's Jurassic list, Park. but the, the same year he did, he did, he did Jurassic park and then Schindler's list. Yes. He, he wanted to tell like an adult story. After that, you can definitely see the rest of his work being kind of tainted by the fact that he did Schindler's List because Lost World comes out four years later, and it's it's a little uh, he's using a different cinematographer, Janusz Kaminski, who is a brilliant Polish cinematographer, and you can tell that he has a different kind of color scheme than uh, who shot oh who was the guy who shot Jurassic Park Dean Dean Cundy or something yes. right yeah the guy who he would do like Halloween Back to the Future you know, yeah, he had a varying thing, style I mean, yeah. he had a varying style himself and this was something that I noticed like with Close Encounters I was looking in the credits I'm like was was the, the director of photography it reminded me so much the look of the movie reminded me so much of Superman the movie yes in that sort of foggy hazy. And I was thinking, oh, is it Jeffrey Unsworth? It wasn't Jeffrey Unsworth. And but it had that look, and like that's the kind of movie where it's like I, I thought it was, but didn't Jeffrey Unsworth die though? He, he died did a while back. He, he oh, he died actually right after he finished Superman the movie. Now, just a, as a quick primer of of Spielberg's career, he starts in 1968 with a student film, Amblin, and he was one of these people who went to film school, he got a job working as like a page or a production assistant at Universal, he sneaks into this the um he sneaks into the closed set of Hitchcock's family plot and he was kicked out off the stage. And um Well also I remember part of the story is he got his best Bar mitzvah suit. He only had like one suit. And then he sort of lived he wouldn't say lived, but he, he just would walk into the studio. People thought he worked there. And he like took over an office for a while. This is like right. this is like the lore of Spielberg. He just walked and somebody like at Universal was like, "Kid, you've got gumption. You've got gumption. I'm gonna kick your ass. But first, <laughs> I'm gonna kick your ass. But first, I'm gonna have you direct an episode of Night Gallery, and you're gonna have to deal with Joan Crawford. Yeah, one of the best, actually. Uh, you know, okay, this is the great thing about okay. I was born in Cincinnati, Ohio, in Cincinnati General Hospital. 
where Steven Spielberg was born also. And oh. a little guy we like to call Charlie. Ooh. So we were all from that same area. He's an army brat. He, brat. He, he lived mainly with his mom. His dad was like all over there. That's why, you know, there's all this father stuff, father issues that happen in Spielberg movies. It's very especially, interesting. Especially in E.T. Yeah, there's there's no uh, father. But well, E.T. is revolutionary well, on so many different levels. It's a movie E.T. I, not only is there no father, like then they talk about the father, like they, they find his clothes in the garage. Yeah, it's and, and the whole thing. I mean, like I never even thought about it when I was watching it when I was a kid, which is mm -hmm. why I'd love to see it again on the big screen. But it's it's totally and shot from a, the that, point of view of That's another movie that has that was re-edited. That was actually, I wouldn't say re-edited, but oh, like they, they cleaned it up. It, right? They took all they took, the guns they took, out and put They took the guns out. In. They changed E.T. They made a sort of a CG E.T. Luckily, you changed sort of, it back, but okay. But they changed it back. Okay, there has to be a rare version of E.T. out there that you'll find because I know a guy with the kind of reach and power that Spielberg has will say, because he did this with Close Encounters, he'll say, Get, recall every, every, every copy of that movie. Mm -hmm. I want them... I want them burned in a bonfire. Somebody has to have copies of that somewhere. Oh, yeah, that because it was kind of a big release. It was, I believe, like an early 2000s release, maybe late 90s release of what E.T. Was the, is coming back. What was the thinking ever. behind that? Why would you do that? I think it was an attempt because this was around the time when the PC sort of now now we have PC backlash. But at the time, there was a thing to backlash about where it was like things were just like they were trying to sort of sanitize everything to like not frighten people. They were banning books. You know, they're probably still doing this, but oh, like, they're and they doing were, it. Yeah, they are doing it. Definitely. And we're living this in that goes right to now, your man. other to your other show. It's like stuff is like, well, we're not comfortable with showing it because it is ostensibly a kid's movie. So I think they were like, well, I don't know how, how this could have been Spielberg's decision. I don't know, because he is a a film preservation of, of any anybody that would think like is a film preservation well, maybe he's got a little bit of that lucas virus in him like um i believe in restoring and preserving all films except my own i have power over those of recent i have not seen um any any spielberg movies any recent ones like uh, uh tintin i did not see warhorse i didn't see lincoln i didn't see bridge of spies Although I, I'm told Bridge of Spies is really quite good. War Horse is really good. You wouldn't you wouldn't believe a movie with Tom Hiddleston and a horse would be a good movie, and it would be kind of pretentious, but it's actually very entertaining. Uh, Lincoln is excellent, I think. It's it's like somehow the thing I like about Lincoln is he takes something that you you feel like has been done to death, which is stories about Lincoln and a guy in makeup pretending to be Lincoln. Yeah, and he somehow makes it fresh and interesting and pertinent to anything that's ever going on it's like it's it's this this very interesting take on the material what do you think of the of the uh the arguments that go around i've been hearing these a lot lately that spielberg was a better filmmaker uh when he was uh earlier early on in his career and that when he became more mature was making more movies with mature subject matter i guess starting with uh, Schindler's List in 93 that he was not as effective a filmmaker as he was because his his gifts his gifts as a storyteller or as a filmmaker were more uh, uh, that sort of childlike sense of wonderment that you see in things like E.T. that you see in Indiana Jones Jaws uh, you know it, it, what, do you think he was a more okay. effective filmmaker back here's then? here's what I think okay Jaws is actually a guy making a movie that he was way out of his depths in and somehow he pulled Mr. it Bond. together. You're out of your depth. <laughs> you're out of your depth. <laughs> um, but I think that, it, he, but he did, he, he nice sucked pun it up. Too, and he did. By the way, out of his depth, Jaws, get it. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> you made a what pun. If, what, man. what if Christopher Walken was in that movie? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to kill the shock, but I'll do it. I'll find him for three, find but him. I'll catch him and kill him for 10. <laughs> that just sounds uh, I think that, it was a movie. Somehow he pulled it together and made a good movie, despite all, and a lot of the crap. It wasn't his was not his fault. So I'm not saying. But he basically took worst case scenario and made an excellent film with it, which kind of showed he can do anything. He was still able to give it. It was a. It's a solid movie. It's not sentimental Spielberg, as far as I'm concerned. It's it's no, not like E.T. Spielberg. There are moments of sentimentality, definitely. Well, with, with the every movie Roy and his son. Yes, which is then, like loses its relevance and hatcheted to death and jaws the revenge they did like a oh, flashback yeah, of that yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Oh, That's there's a great exactly. cartoon, though. Somebody made a great little comic cartoon, put it up on one of the Jaws sites. It was a big shark talking to a little shark, and the shark says, give us a kiss. The shark, the little shark says, why? And he says, because I need it. I just thought it was really cute. <laughs> it was just like, you know, father and son sharks. Father talking. and son sharks. Um, so you were saying. But I think that, like, okay, so he, he does that, and then he does close. Now, Close Encounters is the full Spielberg experience. And that's why, like, when, when we did the review of, like, you are overwhelmed and you you do you do have a sense of wonder, but it is kind of a sloppy movie. And it's Yeah, in terms of the, its narrative. The, the but I will say there's one sense. thing I liked about the special edition that yeah. I missed in the in, in this version we watched. It's John Williams does an orchestration version of When You Wish Upon a Star. And that was wonderful to see in the special edition. But they don't really do that in this one. Yeah, I, I remember there's the little foreshadowing too when he's in his little in his little office or something and he like lifts something up and it's like a little thing. Ming, 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 ming. Yeah. And it's like a little music box thing. Well, also uh, there's, yeah. And there's, he talks about at the beginning of the movie, he's like, you know, let's go see Pinocchio. You know, do you want to go to Pinocchio? It's got a lot of, it's, it's a cartoon. It's animated. You'll all have a wonderful time. Or do I you imagine, want to wait around imagine, at goofy yeah. golf? Yeah. You know, or do you want to, or do you want to go goofy golf where we're crowded and we know golf? I'm imagining you're, you, you have those moments where you're the exasperated dad and you're just like, do you want to have a good, well, I mean, we're going to have a family moment here. Damn it. It's, it's a, te it's really fun. I like those moments with him and his family, but it's a little bit over the top because these kids are just, it's just, it's enough. I don't know. For some reason, Dreyfus's character is focused throughout the movie, even with all these kids running around doing crazy things. There's this one kid who has this doll. And he's just smashing it up against this yeah. thing that, during that the feels, scene. First, when I see that, it's like, that feels very Spielberg. That's like, let's, let's put, let's have kids and you doing feel like, goofy things in the background. And you feel like he, Terry Gar is the id of the family. And that's why she's really, she goes over the edge, you know, because yeah. she has to deal with these kids every day. You know, I think that like Spielberg does this and then he gets, he gets super kind of like loose when he does 1941 but he's just having fun with he's basically just goofing off with the guys and, and gets kind of ahead of himself. And then after that happens, that's kind of a it's thought of as a flop, or at least it was to him, even though it made its money back. Yeah. So he kind of like took a break. And then that's when he did Raiders of the Lost Ark, which is like he did it. He did it fast. He did it relatively cheap. He did it for like 20 million dollars Well, before he did Raiders, though, is when he finished his special edition of close Encounters. yeah oh yeah that's right he so he did close, close encounters, encounters 1941 he, he and then he took a step back and said wait a minute i want to add this stuff in from close encounters yeah but then he does he does raiders which he did he did it like 20 million dollars i heard like he sh they shot it in 25 days they sh literally shot it in like a month or something yeah. yeah he just went in did it uh you know harrison ford he got dysentery <laughs> yeah and then shot one of the most classic scenes because of it and then um, became i mean proceeded to become because of Han Solo and Indiana Jones, one of the biggest stars ever in films and mm -hmm. one of the last truly box office bankable stars. Because at that time, it seemed like everyone wanted to see Harrison Ford in movies. It didn't even matter what the movies were. He had very few flops. you know. Yeah. And then after that, Tom Cruise is probably the last guy that a lot of people would want to see in movies. But even now, it, his career is uh, Even now, if, if it's The Mummy or... But however, if you it's make... Very, it, it's it, very few and far between that you'll have people going to movies because an actor is in it. People will go to... Uh, yeah, Maybe you're Clooney, right. but even Clooney, Clooney appears well, in Clo flops. Yeah, but Clooney doesn't bring them in. People aren't going to go, oh, the new George Clooney... A George Clooney movie will be like sort of a heavy drama that, that like old people will go to and it'll make a good amount of money, but it won't be like this but there massive... Was a, there was a period, but no, there was maybe a period. the mid to late 90s where Harrison Ford would be involved in a movie and become an enormous hit. And he was he was picking up cast-offs and making them hits. Uh, the Fugitive was supposed to have been an Alec Baldwin film. Alec Baldwin dropped out, Harrison Ford took it, and it became an enormous hit. What that was, was a that? movie. Patriot that, Games. That, that, that was a movie that was also good another by Alec Baldwin cast off. Patriot Games became an enormous hit. Yeah, well, that was that was like politics going on at Paramount. They didn't want to deal with Alec Baldwin. So I guess. <laughs> and, but uh, yeah, Fugitive was good by accident. If you sh if you saw like they were literally making that movie with half of a script, and they weren't even done shooting it. And it had like a, you're talking about release dates. They were shooting that thing like up until like March, April. It came out in August. They were editing as they made it. It somehow came out to be, and I think it's a classic. But I think but, I, th I, I like that Harrison Ford just sort of stepped in at the last minute and and saved the production. Yeah. Well, also, I mean, way. he got paid a ton of money. 
Yeah, he it's did. Like, but that's, he, that's but why he, he came did back it. I mean, it's Star like Wars. That's you why don't think back. you never think. Okay, we can't get Alec Baldwin, so let's ask Harrison Ford. It it should be the other way around, you know. That's true. Uh, but I mean, you got Harrison Ford. He's coming back to do uh, the new Blade Runner, which, by the way, looks awesome. I guess I, I just I can't get behind Ryan Gosling. Gosling well, is not a man. Harrison Ford is a man. Gosling I, is a he. He always has this look on his face like he's a twenty four year old heroin addict. He just <laughs> looks like a heroin addict half the time. I I, I asked I asked Bronwyn. I said, do you think he's good looking? Do you think he's hot because he's like he was like people's sexiest man alive or some shit, and everybody thinks he's hot? She looked, took one look at him, sized him up, and said, no. I, in fact, I can't even believe he's an actor. Oh, we were back to the original uh, discussion, which was, do you think his work has improved or, or gotten worse in his old age? I think it has matured, and I think it's us as the public are thinking we want, we want our big dumb, not even dumb, but we want our big '80s Spielberg movies. Well, you're thinking, okay, take this into account. You got Jaws, Close Encounters, Raiders, E.T. Uh, those are like the big movies, and those are the yeah. ones that are always remembered. And now we have, what do we have here? Like Lincoln, Bridge of Spies, War Horse, Tin Tin. Well, now wait a minute. Now, what what movie did he? What was his first movie? It was Sugarland Express. His first theatrical movie was Sugarland Express. And then before movie. that, it was Duel, and then was, a, that was a TV movie. But I'm I'm saying like that has such a he, Sugarland he Express do, has, he, has a very he started, 70s he's sensibility versatile. to it. He's versatile, and it's we expect him. to... He's going to do a movie that's a very spiel. It might be the most Spielberg movie ever made. Uh, Ready Player One. Is coming out, based on um, the book. Yeah, let me take and a look at that. And it's probably going to be the most Spielberg movie Ugh, ever. It says Zach Penn wrote it. Oh, I mean, it it actually has been a very bad summer for Hollywood. Uh, not too many big movies out there making you know being enormous hits, uh, but the talent itself isn't enough to sell it. What sells it is promotion, really. You 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 put in a lot of money to promote something, and this is how see, it, Hollywood it really has managed to create people, a new when, system. When people when people make like even halfway decent things like uh, the movie it okay that's a remake of a tv movie from the 90s yeah but people wanted a well made horror movie that they kind of remember something that like it kind of like jog something in your memory of like and oh, this I know is what a surprise is. hit it is it, it, uh, it was not they were not expecting it, it to It made pull 123 in. million dollars this weekend. They were expecting it would probably make 50, back its money. 50 60 million and I yes. think it has a budget of probably close to 100 cuz just Hollywood movies cost a ton of money just for whatever. So it's already made back its money. I'm going to guess with this opening it's probably make close to 3. I don't think it's going to dip that much. So it'll probably make close to 3 if not more. Um, I mean, that literally opened to more money than Wonder Actually, Woman no. opened to. <laughs> the budget for it is $35 million. Oh, shit. Yes, and it's already They're made. They're going to make a ton and, of money. In, including now, it's already made $189 million. Wow. So this is a surprise. Even when they make, even when they make the inevitable part two to finish the story, maybe have like a 60-70 after they pay everybody. Yeah. That's still like a really low budget for this kind of movie, and then that'll make a ton of money. Yes, it's like it's it's Starting very much like a surprise hit in the way and, that say Blair Witch, <laughs> and like Jessica Chastain, and you remember uh, uh, Blair Witch and uh, Cloverfield. I mean, just surprise hits. So this this is very good for that. So to sum up, uh, Steven Spielberg is a genius, even though some of his movies some people don't like. I'm not a huge fan of the movie Hook. Uh, I had a uh, girlfriend a people, who was psychotic over that movie. She a lot of people it. love that movie. I'm she like, had it on an endless loop in her house. I may have to go back and watch it, but I remember watching it in its original, like watching it on VHS when it came out. I, I remember being somewhat underwhelmed, but I might enjoy it more because, you know, you always get that sort of nostalgia factor. It's Robin Williams. It always gives it that sort of tinge of sadness. Some of his movies are not my favorites, but others, other of, others of his movies I love, much like Close Encounters when we went. And, uh, you know, say Raiders of the Lost Ark. Uh, well, Hook, Hook was weird. Hook was a lost period kind of movie for him. It was around the time of Always and all that stuff. But my big problem with Hook was that it was shot on a soundstage. It was shot at the Sony Studios where um, – and it was all, like, enclosed in this set, and you could tell. And it was it – was, you felt like you were watching a TV show kind of. It does the exact opposite of what Coppola's Dracula did because they shot it on the same lot. With the same writer, I might add, James Hart, 
Uh, but Coppola does a better job of negotiating the studio. Well, yeah, and he went in with a specific look that he was going for that sort of lent itself to shooting in a studio, too. Mm-hmm. What are your thoughts on Spielberg? What's, what's your sort of final thoughts on Spielberg? Oh, Spielberg, you know, um, my, okay, somebody put up a quote. I think it might have been on the VHS Rewind site. Leonard Malton said something about, uh, you know, uh, film, if you want to, something about Star Wars is not the beginning, middle, and end of film study, and, you know, um, it's not the greatest movie in the world, and film students and people wanting to make films shouldn't just watch that movie or something like that. You know, I'm not a... There are a lot of classical movies that I enjoy. Uh, I'm not a fan of a lot of the stuff that that film students look at over the years. Uh, I'm not a fan. I don't like Citizen Kane. I don't like um, Ivan the Terrible 1 and Ivan the Terrible 2. I'm not into the Odessa step sequence from the movie Battleship Potemkin. I'm, I'm, I like Hitchcock. I like that kind of stuff. I like the stuff that, that reaches out and touches its audience. And I feel that uh, in studying film as long as I have for as many years as I have and I've made films myself, my true teachers in film were people like George Lucas and Steven Spielberg. I grew up watching those movies and they left such an incredible, indelible impression on me that I learned so much about craft, about, oh, Stanley Kubrick too, another hero of mine who I absolutely love. Yeah. Um, it, it's it, my my education is encapsulated in in Spielberg and in Lucas. These these people are my heroes in filmmaking because they can tell a story, even as simple as it could possibly be, but have so many layers of analogy, metaphor, symbolism, and be able to do it in such a way and to have such a long life over that over that that time period watching those movies. Uh, that that's where. I learned to make movies. That's where I learned to tell stories, not from Orson Welles and not from Pasolini or, mm -hmm. or, or Fellini or Bergman, uh, however many films and, of those. And what's interesting, what's interesting about that is, is Lucas and Spielberg, they learned about film from them, from these older directors, from these older filmmakers. So it, it's literally, it's almost like, like how things are recycled, like, like supernova, you know? Well, things they're, are they're sort a product of, of the film and, school. Yeah. They're a product of, they watched John Ford movies. They watched Howard Hawks movies. They watched uh, William Wyler movies, Billy Wilder. Well, see, you had to go to film school to learn about John like, Houston. film and see lots of films. and, and You had films. to, yeah. But now, now we you have don't. A, now you don't. Everything's on video and people discuss it. Yeah, my it. film school was cable television in the early 80s. The greatest movies being released were being released were were coming out on cable around that time, and I learned so much. And now we have even like newer filmmakers that I mean, they can go on the internet and they can w listen to shows like this and they can discuss film. This is we couldn't do that. Yeah, we would just be like, "Hey, did you see this movie? That was yes, awesome. I saw it on cable. It had boobs of, in it. Of, you know, it was awesome." Of yeah. heavy heavy analysis for those who are serious about film, we can talk about it, we can dissect it, and we can watch it. Mm -hmm. You know. And this we can is a new. It. This is a new thing for the masses that that was right. not around at the we time. We can pump it right into our living rooms. We don't have to go and find them like we had to, like back when we were kids. If you wanted to see old movies, you had to go to like the repertory and it, cinemas. And it even applies to TV shows. I mean, literally, it's like you just have to. If you watch your your favorite show, the sad part of it is that we don't really, for a new generation, we're not seeing people with that kind of talent anymore. We're not seeing the new. Brian De Palma. We're not seeing the new uh, David Cronenberg, the new uh, David we Lynch. Get a few, we get a few of uh, the, the director. The new Spielberg, the, the new Lucas. Uh, I'm going to, uh, I'll say it right now. Uh, Denis, Vill Denis Villeneuve. He is the director of the new Blade Runner. And he directed Arrival. And he directed Sicario. And he directed, uh, I believe, the movie Enemy with Jake Gyllenhaal, which is really good. Mm. He, is, he is a very good director. He is on their level he is a spielberg he's right he's ridley scott he's and we're not right seeing in there. A, well ridley scott martin uh, scorsese scorsese he's in there he's in there he's in that he's he he is a man you know he's talked about this he loves film he he wanted the job like a lot of people would be i'm afraid to do blade runner 2 you know i don't want to do it instead of he's like no i know that if i get this movie i can do it justice because i love blade runner i love film in general and I've seen his films, and I'm like, if anybody, honestly, Ridley Scott is not Ridley Scott anymore. So, yes, give it to somebody new. Give it to somebody fresh. 
Well, which we'll, we'll see what happens. We'll see what happens. We'll see. You have we'll... one name. You gave me one name, and I gave you, I gave you all of the history of cinema. You gave history me one of cinema. Name. Well, I'm just saying, off the top of my head, I could probably come up with a few other newer ones. There but... might be a couple of really talented, but the pro- I think I think the big problem is that it's all been done. And what we need to do yeah. is consider and it gets turning, harder, and, it get, and it gets harder because maybe the best way for it to remain fresh is to take film and change it, cha- turn it, turn it. Well, um, on its in a head. way, in a way, it has. I mean, I mean, we, we're not really into it, but video games, video games are this new sort of form form of storytelling that you know the kids will probably tell you about this. Like, and it's this new sort of long form. You're you're literally part of whatever the story is. And you're participating in it. It's this new sort of art form. It doesn't really appeal to me, but I can see why other people might enjoy it. It's a different kind of entertainment. And then you'll, of course, have different kinds of writing and different kinds of storytelling and and things like that. That you know, entertainment is is sort of it, it evolves. You know, like us talking about movies. 200 years ago, there was hell 150 years ago. There was nothing like this. Mm-hmm. There was we, what did we most we had was say stage plays. That was the best you could do before right. that. I mean, people like, like cave paintings. I mean, everything evolves to something. So us being all cranky about, ah, it wasn't like, you know what? There'll be something new. There's always something new coming up, new kinds of entertainment, new kinds of ways to be simulated. And guess what? We're old. We can enjoy all of our old people stuff for us. And then the next generation that we complain about, they get to have their entertainment. It's not affecting us. We can still have our stuff. There's still plenty of stuff that we like, that we liked, that we can enjoy, and we can just have that for us. And then they get to have theirs. So it, it works. It's not a bad thing, I don't think. Maybe I'm am I wrong on this? Well, I feel like you wrote I feel like you wrote the obituary of film right there with that. Uh, perhaps. You know what? But it's it's their world. It's much like George Lucas selling off his Star Wars. It's like, you know what? I give it to you. You give me a ton of money, and then I give it to you. You do what you want with it. It is yours now. This is my gift to you. We picked up uh, the uh, Blu-ray of the 40th anniversary of Close Encounters uh, a couple of weeks ago. Came out. A couple of days, like maybe five days after it was in theaters. Yeah, it was. It came out in the th- obviously to tie in. Yeah, it right? came out. They were gonna. I think that they were originally gonna be like it was intended to be just like a new 4K transfer because like the, that's the new thing of uh, you can get basically you have Blu-ray and then you have 4K Blu-ray and the 4K Blu-ray is basically four times the resolution plus uh, HDR and improved color space. And uh, that's like what you would get, like the premium. And then, of course, you would have to have a 4K TV and, and, and all that stuff to be able to enjoy that. Now, I, I have the Blu-ray. You have the Blu-ray. I have a plasma. You have, I think, an LCD. You, I think you have a slightly smaller screen. You probably don't. Have this. I have an LCD, but I also looked at it on, on I a looked tube. at the theatrical version on a on tube. tube. And uh, yeah, I so noticed. On a, on a 27-inch JVC. But you have to remember, the original sort of thing that they used for the transfer i think it's the same thing that they used for that 4k so it's like it's a 4k master that they did sort of downgrade to like 1080p for the blu-ray and then they and then they of course they have the 4k transfer for the 4k um so it's basically the best quality you can get on blu-ray is what you're going to get from a 4k transfer that is then sort of downgraded to blu-ray quality and i noticed it had the same grain and noise and it didn't just seem to be film grain. It seemed to be an extra layer of noise that was brought upon by being scanned digitally when I saw it in the theater and even when I watched it on my TV. And I looked, and I, I, I don't know if you noticed, like, remember how the, the credits kind of come up? They kind of, like, fade in and fade out. Mm-hmm. And digital seems to always have problems with fade-ins and fade-outs. Like, they'll pixelate as they kind of go in and pixelate as they come back in. And if you look yeah. really, really close, and maybe you can look on your thing, too slight amount of pixelation as it comes in and slight amount of pixelation as it goes out. You got to really look, but it's there and it, it, it kind of goes along with that sort of grainy look to the picture. Yeah, but uh, and I got a, a bit of a, a mind blower for you if you're ready to have it all blown. Right. <laughs> all right. Um, on the, um, uh, the, the tube television, yeah. it was absolutely flawless. It looked incredible. Probably because it, the CRT. Probably because it was it's fantastic. Small. Well, remember, I'm watching on... 50. Even I feel like I got the grain too. You can yeah. even see some oh, yeah. grain yeah. in there. I mean, I I got like that's the thing. You watch it on something that is a it's not 1080p. 
It's not 720p. It's not even 480p. It's 480i. So you're yeah. going to you're getting a, de a degraded, slightly softened image compared to what I'm getting. And also mine is you're literally one quarter. You're almost like one quarter the size because if if you took your 27 inches, if you took your 27 inches, and it's letterbox. So yeah, if you took your yeah, you took yeah, your yeah. 20, it took it's a third of the was, of the whole yeah, image. So yeah, so you take that, it would literally be almost four times the size on my TV because I got a 51 inch plasma. I'm thinking like it because it's small. Like if I if I was watching on say like a a smaller plasma or just like a smaller LCD, like say my I have a yeah. 32 inch LCD, I might not notice these imperfections blown up, and that's why even though that this had some imperfections they were even more pronounced when I saw it in the theater because they were on that huge. Screen. Oh, they were way. And yeah. Yeah. You close. could definitely see and what all it the seemed flaws. Like what they did was in order to do sort of the 4k, which, you know, 4k Blu-ray when done right, looks great, but it has enhanced black levels, enhanced colors, enhanced brightness and everything. And in trying to sort of amp up, I noticed even on my thing, the picture was brighter than normal. The picture was darker than normal. The picture had like <coughs> like <coughs> colors that were like brilliant and it seemed like it was an attempt to pump up the picture like it was sharper it was brighter well, I, went, it was I went back i went back in my head watching the blu-ray yeah. i went back to the rca columbia home video vhs i went back to the tv version that i saw abc again i believe uh, and I went back to the Criterion Director's Cut on Laserdisc. This beat it handily, Blu-ray. The Blu-ray destroys all those other versions. Oh, yeah. It's fantastic to look at. It's one. It's um, also I have a Blu-ray player that's a very old yeah. one, so it came with RCA you jacks plug that in. too. Yeah, in addition, the newer ones so you could it. plug it directly into the TV. See now, Blu-ray players are being made without. Are them they all they have is like an HDMI out, and if you're lucky, like an old-style digital yeah. out, and that's it. Now the real okay, the real discovery on on this Blu-ray yes. is the theatrical, theatrical version. version, which I have not seen. I don't think since. Well, it, it was never released on video, was it? Never released on video. But if you watched it, the ABC broadcast, that was basically the supercut of everything that was in the original cut, everything that was in the special edition, and then a few other scenes thrown in to make it 143 minutes long so they could run it at like about three hour and 15 minute movie because we make it an event. Make it an yeah, event. Make it. Yeah. Now this, this theatrical cut is interesting uh, for me on, on two, on two levels. You have two scenes that were cut out for when the special edition was mm -hmm. made, which is a scene of Roy at his job at the power yeah. plant being told by a supervisor to go out and do something what go out, go out to this place to f figure out the problem with the power outage and then the second scene with Apollo Creed Carl Weathers uh as one of the guards one of like the the the, the, M the he's MPs, one of the guards one of the he has like a little he has a conversation with Dreyfus he basically Dreyfus goes up to he's on his way to Devil mm -hmm. Tower Devil's Tower and he gets I stuck at at a roadblock yeah. and Carl Weathers tells him we have orders to shoot looters yeah by the way, this, like is, this is not this is not a, a stunt casting celebrity cameo, and I and I know this because when I was watching the making ofs, this thing was actually shot like mid 1976. This is before Rocky came out. They they so it was before Carl Weathers. Before became... Carl Weathers was he, he may have shot Rocky before that, but it didn't come out until late 1976. So this is being shot like so he's probably just, you know he's a working actor. I could swear he was he had a little bit of like he had some stuff going. On. He wasn't even like. He was in some movie like in the 70s where it was like it was kind of like the Dirty Dozen or something. It was one of those kind of movies. It was like some sort of war movie. And he was one of the guys at Kelly's Heroes or something. Or that's a little early. It might have been Kelly's Heroes. He was uh, in that. Let me check. Uh, he was before all Bjorn. of this. I think he was a football player and he was like a football player trying to get into acting. So he was probably like this sort of like new guy. He was like an MP. And he comes in and tells him. Actually, uh, Carl Weathers was in well, he was in a bunch of black black exploitation oh, okay. movies. Oh, yeah. But he was in also Magnum Force in an uncredited role. That thing might have literally been cut out just because of the popularity of Rocky. When when he got to the special edition, and he cut this because it is kind of redundant. It doesn't really need to be there. It's not necessary. And, no, it doesn't need to then, be there. And, then, and also, you know, Roy Neary's power, power plant scene isn't really necessary either. Well, it's good to, it that is, we cut right to is, him doing his I job. I want to get to that because and this goes to deleted scenes. It's not even in the movie. As people know, as they've seen this movie, he is basically unceremoniously after he has the encounter with the with the UFO and then he comes home and he's got the kind of the 50 50 bar face. He gets he like, again, his wife is his dispatcher for some reason. 
yeah. and uh, she she picks up the phone and you hear her and he basically gets fired for we don't really know why like you don't really know and there's this deleted scene where it's kind of when he's out on his run it's all this stuff of him trying to get there the reason he's there in the first place in the place that he's in is because he basically uh, violates a direct order from his boss telling him to go to a certain place because he's like he's worried that something will get turned on and somebody will get blown up because they're on a on a wire or something he, he says no i'm going here so he goes he goes somewhere he's not supposed to go so it makes complete sense as to why he would get fired because well i again i the 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 wisdom of firing someone who's in a powerful union is a bit much on on that end uh, uh but he the, the the big problem is that Nothing they could have done would have brought the power back. What what cut down what 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 shut the power yeah. down was the aliens, obviously. But then it came back up again. Well, see, there's there's so, again in the deleted scene. Obviously, he has a boss creating, that hates him. The reason the power went out was they were creating mischief. It kind of goes to like when the, when the kid is in the house and they're like like tearing up the fridge. Um, yeah, this yeah. deleted scene. Well, th- yeah, in, that that was okay. In this, Very ET like. In this scene, deleted that, that scene, bit. he's there, and they've they've taken like wires down. Like there's a whole bunch of wires were just taken down. Like it looked like somebody tore up the wires. So it's almost like they so were just a little vandalism. Yeah, they, there, they were little... literally. That might have been why the power went out because of, they were doing vandalism. I I uh, I watched on. Um, it's each version, but then uh, like in the theatrical version. Um, Terry Gar's character really comes off badly. Yeah, she is. The director's she is, cut makes more sense because there's more of him being crazy and the context and the arguments and the back and forth. And maybe maybe Terry being a little more sympathetic. Well, there's in the later in this version, room, I don't know if you notice it's kind of like quietly when when they find out that he's fired and he it's actually like first he gets fired she gets the phone call then he looks at the pillow and he he kind of sees the 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 mountain in the pillow that that's something that's that in that version. You hear her very quietly saying, "I am not getting a job." I am. Yeah, I heard that. I did. I caught. I caught that. So it seems like there was a, a like an agreement made early on of, "I'm going to work, you're going to have the kids, and that's going to be it." And you know, people people have their agreements, and that's fine. But it seemed like her world was falling apart, and he was messing it up with his craziness, and it was getting worse <laughs> and worse. And she also says. Like when when they go when he like takes it like no we're gonna go we're gonna go this is gonna be better than Goofy Golf this is gonna yeah and which I noticed in that and they didn't even exactly. mention that in the theatrical in version cut, there was no part at which they cut out everything they kept basically when we get to Roy's house in the theatrical yeah. version it begins with Terry Gar saying all right everybody yeah. time for bed right, we get to watch the Ten Commandments there was yeah. n- none of the conversation about conversation. Pinocchio That's a good conversation it's funny and so of course none of the crazy kid with the doll smashing yeah, it over that, the uh, playpen um, he's sort of like f- trying to figure out the way around a narrative in a movie that he's controlling this was his first real movie that he was the absolute boss on um other than the producer yeah, you know? he, jaws he was he was hired he was for hired jaws and, he, and like he talks about this in the making of stuff he was hired for sugarland express and for duel he, and all he that was stuff. hired for jaws and everything went wrong on that movie everything yeah, went wrong yeah. and he was like i never want to go through that again because it was a horrific ex- it's much like yeah it was mainly mainly production design problems but he he hired Joe Alves, the production designer for Jaws, to be the production designer on Close Encounters too. So it wasn't completely well, it was more, that. It was more like. And also, Joe Alves went on to direct Jaws three. Oh, he was he was a victim of just like weather. Everything went everything was just going wrong. It was like yeah, he, he yeah, planned yeah. everything, but it just everything went wrong. And somehow they pulled it. He pulled it out of his ass and made a good movie. A lot of it was editing in the movie of like one half second more, and the shark would have looked like crap. The, this theatrical cut, which had, I guess had it been not seen until now. Yeah, that's correct. Uh, here's wh- how's so that work. It, it went was, right into the closet in 77 and now it's it out. It was released in 1977, made a ton of money. It was a huge hit. It was not Star Wars big, but it made like 130 some million dollars, which in 1977 dollars, we're talking like about a $450 million hit. Huge hit. And but also three hundred million worldwide. Three hundred million worldwide. So that's like probably an old money. That'd literally be like a billion plus movie in today's. Audience. It's a hit. It's a definite Huge, hit. It's not as hit. big as Star not Wars. Star, it's not Star Wars level, but actually, wait a minute. Three hundred million Star Wars made like. Oh wait, one more thing yeah. I forgot to mention: the product placement in this movie is ins- insane. Is it? Yes, Coca Cola, oh, well, Coca- McDonald's, Baskin Robbins, Piggly Wiggly. 
Well, I think that in a w- Budweiser. I mean, like it's all commercials and, I think and stuff. in a weird way it works because it 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 works in the context of this is America at this time. This is what it's America at this time, which isn't that different from now, mm-hmm. but so much. I mean, there's Coke everywhere. I mean, you, you can see Days of Our Lives, there's Coca Cola uh, signage. NBC, I guess Days of Our Lives because that was on NBC. Coke can and Melinda Dillon's refrigerator turned over and spilling out onto the floor. I mean, it's like a, there's products everywhere in this film. Um, sometimes, you know, and I, I kind of came to terms with it. Of, you know what? Sometimes, especially in divorces and in relationships, sometimes things don't make sense. Things will escalate out of control quite quickly. They it, don't, it, but it does make you wor- wonder. Yeah. What what uh, upon what was their relationship? Yeah, there was based? something going on probably before that. I mean, he was. He I mean, Terry, like Terry a, Gar, I place as a, you know a very easy eight for me i thought she was <laughs> adorable beautiful woman i thought she was great she is not a very likable she's like the only heavy in the movie really put her up against the government and the government will back <laughs> down and then richard dreyfus is kind of i don't know what he is he's kind of like an overgrown kid he's has this he's obviously good with his hands he's an engineer he's into electric he probably is is saddled down into a horrible job uh but he's got all this electrical and engineering equipment around so this is like a, a love of his yeah, it's almost, and it's something it's, that he really likes like, he also loves his kids yeah. he's a great family man he has a great relationship with his kids uh and terry doesn't really come off that way terry comes off as well you'll settle down you'll get married a man will take care of you you'll take care yeah, of the was, kids or something people, like this that this was the 70s this is when you could actually still do something like that and people still try to do stuff like that but it always like the real world always seems to encroach on it but it can be difficult. Right. Like, you know, women women want a guy to take it where – I mean, we can get all, like, about feminist issues. But deep down, most women would much rather have a guy come in, work, take care of her. And they have a very, very tenuous hold yes. on their world. And when Richard Dreyfus comes in and starts making mountains out of shaving cream and mashed potatoes and everything. I it, The thing is, I, would I, th- th- this is just something I, I don't understand. I still don't understand it because I've been happily married for about 17 mm-hmm. years now. And uh, my wife – you know, would would go along with me on this stuff. She would not flip out. She wouldn't take Regan away. She would, she would want to sit me down and talk to me. And, and but I feel like we're there are two separate worlds here, and this is probably because of the 70s. Coming from the 60s, we're getting into the second wave of feminism where men have their world, women have theirs. No matter what, you can't get anyone to translate between these two languages, mm-hmm. the language of women versus the language of men. The language of women is uh, caregiver, mother, that kind of stuff breeder if you will and 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 the man's world is work mm. work work men men we work and mm, yes and goofy golf yeah. you know that kind of stuff whatever it is but he seems like a fourth child in the family yeah and in a way. unfortunately a lot of women are in that relationship these days but it's rather it's rather immature on spielberg's part i well, don't he, think this was spielberg, before, this but was but also married, okay this was before he had kids like yes he, yes he but back. there's also the other the other issue which is melinda dillon yeah Melinda Dillon is a strong character. Yeah. She is a single mother, obviously. Mm-hmm. She's got this kid she's got to take care of. She is like, I, she comes from a different world than Terry Gar. Yeah. She doesn't strike me as a Terry Gar woman. She strikes me as a very strong, confident woman who's capable of taking care of herself. So that also exists in this world. So I'm not quite understanding what Spielberg's attitude toward women well, is at I this point. I think Spielberg has said like, he could not make this movie today. At least that he would, he would work more on that relationship because he didn't. Well, nobody would buy Terry Carr. They would buy Melinda he Dillon. He personally is more mature about relationships and what they are and what they aren't. And he probably would write it differently or make it differently today. I feel like I've seen uh, I've gotten more than my fair share of close encounters over the years, but and including this and seeing yeah. it in the movies, this is good sci-fi because we're asking questions. That's always the best kind of science fiction is the science fiction where you ask questions, mm-hmm. and you, you continually ask them. But there's my my main flaw with the movie now is is Roy Neary. Um, if I were to make this movie, I would do everything Spielberg did except make that central character a family man with obligations and responsibilities. I would make it somebody who is not, who 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 comes off as alien. Roy doesn't really come off as alien. He comes you know, off as kind of a guy who has a it, nervous breakdown. Well, and, it know. could work. It could also work as like I don't like the idea of him ditching his say, family. Say he's like kind of a lonely guy and he's looking for sort of meaning in his in his sort of sad life. Like he's living alone or something like that. Then, then he finds them. He has a beautiful wife. He has three he children. Finds the I mean, meaning he kind of has the American this, dream. This journey, it makes more sense. This is seventies, 
early 80s Spielberg where he's he's do he's in full Spielberg mode doing his thing. Cuz I was thinking about this like you'll see his later stuff like uh say like Jurassic Park. Anybody could have done Jurassic Park. That's not like a, a it doesn't feel very Spielbergian to me. Yeah, that's true. It's that's solid, true. but it it doesn't it doesn't When I yeah, when when you when you when you, when you put the the name Spielberg up against the work. But like compare it to say something It's it's Jaws, it's E.T., it's Raiders, a more it's Close Encounters. Movie. Wait, a mil- more Spielbergian movie like, than Like even 1941 isn't isn't a terribly Spielbergian oh, movie. Oh no, it is. It. If you really look at I, I don't really visually think so stylistically it's it's all over the place but it's it's him trying to sort of inject his spielbergness into a it basically into a bob zemeckis but the narrative's all wacky it It doesn't look like anything that can hold together um it's madness if you take something he doesn't usually do madness well take something like uh war of the worlds okay i think that's better than jurassic park and that has like family drama but that makes a little more sense you have like tom cruise that's a bit the single yeah, th- that ending is a little bit dubious uh, well it it fits in more with the that stupid spoiled brat kid of his winds up you know being okay i mean come ah, on. whatever no <laughs> uh, but like or take like something like he because he'll he'll and he'll do he'll do two big movies in one year he did that and then like literally within he he's a director that can he's super efficient now He'll do two big movies in a year. He'll do like say War of the Worlds, and then he'll do Munich, in one year. Both yeah. excellent films. I think Munich is one of his best, actually. But that's like a Munich's that's good, a heavy yeah. drama. But it's like he he's a very super efficient director. At the time, he was like you know Close Encounters took that was his passion project. He got that done after it took him two years after Jaws. Um, then he went into he was still though he was still in a breakable position as a as a well he, and he then could, he was but a movie could destroy a career back he was then, broken like it did with he like was broken Michael by 1941 Tumino. it was considered a flop even though it I think it broke even and it actually made yeah, a still but he was such a nice guy though that he managed it, well, to get Raiders made because and, the next movie he made was with George Lucas like George Lucas right. gave him his break again and he's and that's when he did Raiders and Raiders he did cheap and quick. When he was when he managed to make Jurassic Park and Schindler's List, he had a double crown of filmmakers. I guess he had he had one of the biggest hits ever mm-hmm. in Jurassic Park for the whole family, and then he had his personal movie for adults that was still popular too. Yeah. Um, okay, so uh, is there anything more to add? We're well, yeah, I want to talk right? about like the sort of the, the sound presentation of the Blu-ray, which. Like, All right. okay, compared to... Oh, well, well first, if you're going to mention sound, uh, the sound, again, the CRT, you just can't fail with it. It's it's two speakers. It's just a small little stereo thing. But I guess the Blu-ray figured, figured out a way to adapt to my sound because it was, it was wonderful. The sound quality was great. It was really good. It's, it's better in, in a lot of ways than your stereo setup, what I have in my living room over here, because... The stereo uh, or whatever, I you 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 watch it on your your surround yeah. sound mix, right? You have like speakers all over yeah. the place. Um, the way the CRT negotiates the sound, it puts everything together in the left and right, but it, it's a nice mix between music, sound effects, and dialogue, and it all comes together very well you can hear everything you can yeah, hear a lot, every of, line a of, lot of tvs will have like sort of i'm not going to say a compression system but like a a sort of audio level meter sort of thing where it's like it'll make it'll make the quiet stuff a little louder and it'll make the super loud stuff a little quieter so it all sort of that's sounds, that's great it's more sort I of tv that. friendly more sort of tube friendly yeah. small speaker friendly um but yeah so like and it works works for so i'm watching it and i i like made a mental note when i saw it in the theater had very little surround sound presence in the theater that I saw it in. Maybe I was just sitting too close to the front, but so I watch mm-hmm. it in my house, big surround sound experience. Bass is like shaking things. I'm getting weird rumblings and things on certain frequencies. Um, I, I, I did notice that the quality of the actual sound was not of the quality that you get in a more modern film. It sounded a mm-hmm. little more like it sounded analog. It's so it sounded a little shrill, it sounded a little shrill and not quite as super high fidelity. I'm sure it's the best. Uh, yeah. Also what, what my, my friend and colleague, Alex Saltz calls clipping, which is like when it's, it starts to feed back on itself. Yeah. It's it, it sounds loud. almost, it's almost like, well, yeah, yeah it's almost that's, like that's, when that's... you, when you have an audio cassette deck and you have the audio level set a little bit too loud when you're recording something, so it's like, come on, come in a little hot. 
comes in a little hot sometimes. And uh, a lot of times in movies like that back then, uh, and up to I'm not really quite sure when they stopped using analog uh, tape recorders uh, for that. You had Na- Nagra four channel, uh, you know, quartz controlled sound mm-hmm. and you had the one sound source and sometimes you had a production sound to match it up so that it was that it would mate with the uh, with the film as it's well, being shot not you use the clapboard of course to sync it up and everything this this happens in most things that are being transferred for digital now when you try to do it and you can only go as good as your original yeah. source so, so it wasn't, there's it, not wasn't much like, you can do this wasn't to like fix a star it. wars thing where they just completely re- raiders had sound problems like that too i remember you know i'd have to go back i've heard i remember the sound on my raiders laser disc sounding great and jaws and jaws well, and those people won oscars well, in <laughs> fact jaws is one of those interesting sort of movies where it was originally recorded in mono cuz m- movies were mono then and then later video releases, like way later, like say into the late, like like anniversary editions in the nineties. Oh, sound is crucial. Sound was crucial to Close Encounters. Yeah. I, I forgot to mention that the sound and the sound effects editing were phenomenal in the movie. They're so well put together, and for a, a kind of an emotional effect, it's almost as though Spielberg. The movie was meant to be a tone poem. It was meant to be music. Yeah. I, I felt like music was so. See, that's- important to them the, 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 and like uh, they talk about like on the making of of like he both he and John Williams came came up with that do, 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 do. they came up with that together like they, they sat down yeah. and like he was like okay Spielberg was like okay I want something a, 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 a musical thing there they communicate in a musical like riff and John Williams was like well it needs to be less than music but more than like something else, like more than a, like a, like a tone or something. It needs to be so that like, we need, we need like something in between. So it's like, we, they came up with like, well, three is too little and, and 10 is too much. we come up with like mm-hmm. five. So they came up with like, we need five notes. And then they literally came up with like different, very, I almost, I almost know why he did that. I, I, because I, I, I'm thinking I'm Spielberg here. Mm-hmm. John Williams is my good luck charm. He is. John Williams, I, I, even the producers of Jaws say that the movie was the reason the movie was successful was because of John Williams' score mm-hmm. more than anything. I, I think the movie would have been nothing without that score. Nah, 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 nah. Yeah, that, that does really. Dun, 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 dun. Which is then reused in 1941. <laughs> the yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah. And the beginning of Airplane. And the, yeah, you're right. You're right. Um, but I think that like oh and Close Encounters when they're doing their little uh, yeah, yeah, communicating goes, through the nah, he goes the, nah, nah, yeah the, nah, nah. the 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 UFO goes nah, 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 yeah nah, nah, nah. yeah you know a little bit so it's like a little gag so I think that like the music does help the but the sound is like it's the best fidelity that they had in the late seventies they they would like what they would mix it they would because they you know they do multiple passes and every time they do a pass in a dub that's like tape over tape over tape over tape and you know it yeah. loses quality as they do that so they had to like put all kinds of dolby on it as they were doing it so there's all kinds of weird distortions plus there's very few very few overdubs very few uh the uh automatic dialogue replacements yeah. in the movie a lot of the the sound is very pure all right uh is that it that's it uh so are we done with close and uh, well i don't think we'll ever be done and for some reason every time i watch it i like it more it's like it's just been this weird experience of I've watched this movie now like I think like three times since <laughs> since we uh, since we started this, and uh, mm-hmm. it's like every time it's like it's it's not even a movie anymore. It's an experience. It's like you said. It's like a it's a it's a it's like a poem. It's like you 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 sit and you and you you experience. It. It's an experience. It's not necessarily a movie anymore. It's an experience and it's a feeling, and it always gets you. It gets you in the feels at the end when he goes on the ship. Yeah, and with the music and the, the lighting and the way he looks and the thing. so it's like, it is a it, it it is a great movie, but there if you hold it up to some any sort of scrutiny, the whole thing falls apart. So it's yeah. so it's not necessarily a. I think I said this before. It's not a movie for your brain. It's a movie for your heart. And on that level, it works. All right, I agree. Well, thank you. <laughs>